In part one of this series on my LRGB workflow, we covered how to use the subframe selector both with and without the expressions tool. And we also covered how to use the weighted batch preprocessor to add data from multiple nights. Now, in the second part of this series, we're going to cover using the strengths of Pix Insight to do the initial development of the masters that result from stacking. So we're going to cover improving and deconvolving the stars and balancing the color as well as aligning all the masters, combining your red, green, and blue channels, histogram transformation, removing the stars, and noise removal. And as we do, we'll take the time to go over the reasons for each developing choice. There's a lot of ground to cover, so let's go ahead and jump in. When the weighted batch preprocessor is done, it will create a smart report that gives a brief rundown of everything that was accomplished in the stacking process. And since there were no problems, I'm just going to go ahead and click on done and open up the files. Before I do that, however, I'm going to reset the weighted batch preprocessor to get rid of all the files in there. Otherwise, it will take several minutes for it to open up the next time I need it as it'll resort all those files before opening. And then I'll have to reset it anyway. Now I'm going to go into the output folder Prox 3 days data, and then open up the masters folder. And there I'm going to find eight masters, one for the L, R, G, and B channels, and also a drizzled version for each of those channels. I'm going to simultaneously click on all four drizzled channels, click open, and they will open in PixInsight. Then I'm going to get rid of these wait windows. They appear as white, and there will be one every other window, so I can just click them out of the picture. Then I'll double click on the left tab and rename each image with a simpler name by the letter of its filter. And I'll reduce the size of each image and hit Control A to execute a screen transfer function stretch onto the image. That's just a temporary stretch. Then I'll drag each one of the masters into the usual spots where I place them when I first start editing. L to the upper left, R to the upper right, green to the lower left, and B to the lower right. When each master is in place, it's time to begin the first step of the Pixin site's early processing. We'll start with RC Astro's Blur Exterminator. On the lower left of the Blur Exterminator window, I have clicked the Correct Only box, and I'm going to drag the slanted triangle over each image to run the Blur Exterminator in correct mode. What this does is correct any aberrations in the stars. I mean, generally, the stars are just fine, but if there were any slight aberrations in there, it will correct and improve them. I know a lot of people complain that this would be a very slow process because Blur Exterminator operates very slowly. So does Noise Exterminator and Star Exterminator for that matter. And they can, but I used the CUDA technique to speed up the exterminators. It took me about 15 minutes to figure out how to do the CUDA technique, but it was well worth it. As you can see, the Blur Exterminator runs over each one of the masters now in just seconds. What this does is it tells the Blur Exterminator to use a graphics card. And of course, the graphics card is specifically designed to process graphics. Unless you use that technique, the Blur Exterminator is just using your CPU, so its speed is much more limited. So it used to take about 10 minutes to run the Blur Exterminator on each drizzled master. Now it takes, what, I don't know, 30 seconds? I don't yet have a video on doing this technique, but Keev the Lazy Geek did a very good video on it. If you just Google Speed Up Blur Exterminator and Keev the Lazy Geek, take a look at his YouTube channel. It's an excellent channel you're going to find very good and clear instructions there. Once all four masters have been corrected, I'll then set the Blur Exterminator for default mode by hitting the Circle X icon on the lower right. And then, once again, I'm going to drag the Process icon over each one of the masters. In the default mode, the Blur Exterminator will deconvolve the stars and sharpen up the non-stellar structures. Take note that I sharpen the L, R, G, and B channels separately. Through experimentation, I have found that sharpening them separately produces a better end result. When the Blur Exterminator is done, the next thing that has to happen is aligning each of the masters. This way, later when it's time to combine the images, each one will fit its structures perfectly over the other. So I'll open the Star Alignment tool, and the Luminance channel is going to become the reference image. I'll just drag its tab over into the Reference Image window. Then I'll drag the R, G, and B tabs over into the Target Images channel. Then I'll just click the circular icon and execute the tool. In a moment, it'll create a new R, G, and B image with a suffix registered. Now I'll get the original images out of the way and replace them with each one of the new registered images. I like to keep my work area organized, so garbage files that I'm pretty sure that I'll no longer need go in the column on the lower right. In the column on the top right, I put finished images that I will later transfer over to Affinity Photo and to the left of the upper column on the right. 
I put images that I either intend to get back to or that I'm not sure if I'm going to need them again. When the registered images are in place, the next thing to do is run a statistics check on all of them. And I'm going to look for the image with the highest median. To run the check, I just drag the images tab into the statistics window. I'll drag each of the R, G, and B tabs into the window and take note of the one with the highest median because that image is going to become my reference image in the application of linear fit. Now, I've talked a great deal about how I'm not terribly happy with uh, PixInsight's spectrophotometric color calibration. Sometimes it's great, but often it yields poor and weak colors, especially those awful salmon pinks that are extremely hard to correct in an image. And I find linear fit gives more intense and pleasing to the eye colors very reliably. So I'll open up the linear fit tool and drag the tab from the red image, which had the highest median, into its reference image, and then drag its action icon over the blue and the green images. This will balance all these images' color so that when the R, G, and B are combined, the color looks nice. After linear fits has been actioned on the green and blue channels, I'll reset the screen transfer function so that we can see the outcomes. To do this, I hit Control F12 to reset the screen transfer function or you can press the screen transfer function reset button to be found in the window to the upper right. It's circled with the red circle. And then I'll apply a new screen transfer function to the green and blue images. This will show them correctly. I apply it by hitting control A, or you can hit the screen transfer function button also to be found to the upper right. When linear fit has been actioned on both the green and the blue channels, I'll then open the channel combination tool and drag the tabs from the red, green, and blue images into the appropriate section. In just a moment, the channel combination tool will combine the R, G, and B channels. Once that's done, and to avoid future confusion, I will immediately rename the channel by double-clicking the left tab and labeling it RGB. And since I sometimes use different color combination strategies, I'll label it as RGBLF to denote that it was made using linear fit. And, predictably, Linear Fits has given us a nice, colorful RGB outcome. One of the things you might note is that when you use Linear Fit, you don't have to then use a color channel compensation tool like SCNR to remove excess green or any other excess color. Linear Fit gives you an output of color channels that are properly balanced. Now, I do virtually none of my advanced editing in PixInsight. Because it is not a layer-based, non-destructive photo editor, I find it far too limited. I mean, it's powerful and it's a good editor, but why would I use it when I can use a non-destructive layer-based photo editor? To me, it's kind of like this. I can accomplish a job by using MS-DOS, but I can also accomplish the same job by using Windows 11. Why would I use a cantankerous, old, and awkward tool when I can accomplish the same job efficiently with a modern tool? So as soon as I have all the basic developing steps done, I want to get the images out of PixInsight. PixInsight has some real strengths, mainly in stacking, subframe selection, and initial color balancing. Plus, it runs all the RC Astro tools. But that's really all I need or want PixInsight for. So I just need to accomplish a couple other steps on this RGB image, and then I can get it out of PixInsight. And then I'm going to do a similar process with the luminance image, but we'll come back to that. Right now, let's finish working on the RGB channel. The first thing I need to do is get a good star plate. To me, a good star plate will have a properly balanced histogram, good color, and it's going to be noise free. And I'm going to get that star plate with the star exterminator. The problem is to remove the noise, I'll have to run the noise exterminator. And the noise exterminator does the best job on nonlinear information, otherwise it's inclined to leave artifacts but the star exterminator will do the best job on non-stellar information if it removes the stars while the information is still linear. This means to get the best star plate, I need to remove the stars after the image has had its histogram stretched. But to get the best non-stellar structure, our nebula in the background, I need to remove the stars before the image has had a histogram stretch. To work around this dilemma, I'll clone the RGB LF plate. Then I'll histogram stretch the clone, run noise exterminator, and remove the stars. To make a clone in PixInsight, all I have to do is click and drag on the image tab, then let go. Now I'm going to get the clone ready for star removal. I'll begin by applying the screen transfer function's histogram stretch to the image. So I'll open the screen transfer function tool in the histogram tool, click on the cloned image, and the screen transfer function tool will show the working stretch it's actioned on that image. Then I'll drag the action icon that triangle on its side from the screen transfer function to the histogram tool until I see an hourglass symbol, then let go. The histogram tool will take on the screen transfer function stretch. Then I'll drag the triangle on its side, the action icon, over onto the image and let go. 
and the histogram tool will apply that stretch permanently to the image. As you can see, the image turns white, and that's just because it now has the histogram stretch plus the screen transfer function's histogram stretch. But by resetting the screen transfer function's effect on the image, in my case by hitting Ctrl F12, we can now see the image with a proper histogram stretch. Now I'll just further prepare the clone by running the noise exterminator on it. And now that I have a histogram balanced noise free plate to work with, I'll run the star exterminator. I'll start by clicking select AI and making sure I'm on the most advanced AI, and then select large overlap and unscreen stars and action the process. Large overlap tells the star exterminator to look at larger areas when it removes the stars. It takes more computing power, but I find it consistently gives better outcomes. It removes the stars more completely and leaves fewer artifacts in the original image. And selecting unscreened stars tells the star exterminator that it's working with nonlinear data, or data that has received a histogram stretch, allowing the star exterminator to do a better job when working with nonlinear information. In a few seconds, the star exterminator will produce an extracted star plate, and doing things this way gives us a nicely balanced and colorful star plate that is effectively noise-free. I will save that star plate as a lossless TIFF and put it in the column upper right, which is where I put finished images that are ready for further editing in Affinity Photo. Now, while the screen transfer function has done a pretty good job removing the stars, the star exterminator is designed to work best on nonlinear information. So I'm going to discard the clone of the non-stellar information. Then, on the original RGB information, which is still linear, I'm going to begin working on it by opening the star exterminator, turning off unscreen stars as this information is linear, and actioning the process. Note that I've also clicked off the generate star image box. We're not going to need this star plate. And in a few seconds, the star exterminator will have removed the stars from the linear image of our nebula. This will give us the best possible nebula to then begin editing. When the star plate is removed, I'm going to turn off the screen transfer function's effect on the image, essentially rendering the image black. Then I'm going to open the histogram tool and get the screen transfer function window out of the way, reset the histogram tool, and drag the RGB LF tab into the view window on the histogram tool so that we can see its histogram as we are working. On the left of the histogram box is a hollow blue circle. When I hit it, I get a preview window and I can now see the changes that I'm going to make with the histogram tool. Then applying histogram theory that I covered in a previous video called Perfect Histograms in 60 Seconds, I'm going to adjust the histogram on this image to produce a nice flat image suitable for developing in a non-destructive layer-based photo editor, in my case, Affinity Photo. The theory is simple. You drag the leftmost icon up to the beginning of the light curve, establishing your black point, and you drag the middle icon up to the right side of the light curve, telling the histogram stretching tool how much stretch to apply. In the two number boxes above, scroll the left number up to view the light curve wider, and scroll the right number up to view more of the light curve vertically. I will typically scroll up to about 10 to 50 to make the initial adjustment, then type in 99 to make the light curve even larger, going left and right so I can make a more precise adjustment on both sides, and then type in 500 to 999 to make the light curve as large as possible to make the final adjustments of the left and middle icons. However, sometimes the bottom of the light curve can get lost in the base of the graph, and to help me distinguish where the bottom of the light curve is, on the right number, I might scroll up to two or three, and usually just up to two is sufficient to reveal where the light curve properly begins. This is a process that goes very fast, and generally I have my light curve developed in mm, 30 seconds. I'm going a little slow here to demonstrate it, but this is a very fast process, very easy to accomplish. Once I have the leftmost icon at the beginning of the light curve on the left, and the middle icon at the beginning of the light curve on the right, I then action the histogram tool on the image. The image might look a little over dark and flat, but trust me, that is perfect for editing in a non-destructive layer-based photo editor. In fact, it's what you want. And you'll see how the color and brightness flushes out and works out when we get into the next part in this editing series. Now the RGB plate is almost ready to go. I'm just going to open up the noise exterminator and action it on the plate. And as soon as the noise exterminator is done, this plate is now ready for finished editing in my non-destructive layer-based photo editor. So I'll save this plate as a lossless TIFF, and then get on to processing the luminance file. Now I'm not going to go thoroughly over the whole luminance process, because I can tell you, I am going to use the exact same steps on the luminance channel. I'm going to clone the luminance channel, 
and apply the screen transfer function histogram stretch to the clone and then denoise the clone and remove the stars. Then I'll save the luminance star plate. Now chances are I'm not going to need the luminance star plate. It's maybe 5% of the time that I might use the luminance star plate, but it's good to have it in case I need it later on in the editing. If I don't need it, I can delete it later. And just as before, I'm going to discard the cloned image of the non-stellar structure. Then on the original image of the luminance plate, where the information is still linear, I'm going to have the star exterminator remove the stars. That way it'll do the best job, leaving as much information as possible in the non-stellar structure. And this time I don't have the star exterminator produce a star plate. Then I'll run a histogram stretch on the non-stellar structure using the same process as I used for RGB. And then run noise exterminator on the luminance plate and save it too for later editing in my non-destructive layer-based photo editor. In my case, again, that's Affinity Photo. So now, with an RGB star plate and a luminance star plate, and the luminance and RGB plate to the non-stellar structure saved as lossless TIFFs, the next step is to go into the much more refined and polished editing that's available in a non-destructive layer-based photo editor. So, I'll see you there in part 3 of this series on my workflow for LRGB data. And I'll note again that you can use most of this information for one-shot color camera data, as well as narrowband data. With one-shot color camera data, of course, you won't have to bother with things like balancing your color channels with linear fits and star alignment. And with narrowband data, you would use different color balancing strategies, maybe. And as always, if you have any thoughts, questions, or observations, please leave them in the comments section below. Thank you for watching. Please take a moment to like and subscribe if you found this information useful. And I'll see you at part three on this series. Now, have a blast doing astrophotography and get out there and shoot that sky.